Nobody goes through this life without, without loss and pain. Many people have gone through what, what we have gone through. We have just gone through it with 12 other families together at the same time that have shared this same horrible event. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I have a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. He shot out of the window. And I felt a stinging in the middle of my back. I just started to feel numb. I went into the library. I heard the popping noises get louder and louder as the, the two shooters entered the school. And the school is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I've got students down under the table, kids. Kids under the table. Okay, we don't know what's going on. Black trench coat, uh, shotgun. Okay. You heard as much as I did. Right now, we are getting multiple calls. Okay. And I've got every student in this library on the floor. You gotta stay on the floor. The gun is right outside the library door. When they saw Isaiah, they began to make racial slurs at him. That was the last thing that he heard in his life. Yes, sir, send BG ambulance 12 to the west side and have them hook in with the doctor on the west side. When I saw the red ambulance, I stretched my arms out to it to kind of let him know, like, hey, I'm still here. Could you help me? And we're in the process now. Just clear the rest of the building. We don't anticipate finding any other. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the mother of Columbine victim, Lauren Townsend. Please welcome Dawn Anna Beck. They're here. Can you feel them? Our angels? Kyle? Kelly? Dan? Matt, Corey, Stephen, Rachel, Daniel, John, Cassie, Isaiah, Dave, and my Lauren. We're here because we love them. We're here to honor them. April 20th, 1999. Remember the horror? Remember how broken your heart felt? That emptiness, that pain seared so deeply that it seemed never to want to go away. All memorials begin with the groundbreaking, just as our journeys together began with broken hearts. Remember them. This was a momentous event in the history of the country. And every parent left feeling helpless, even the president because more than anything else, we think the natural order of things entitles every child to a safe home, a safe neighborhood, a safe school. This memorial is not only so that you will never forget the people you love, but so that through your life, you can honor theirs.
Rachel was the middle of my five children. And as a baby, uh, sometimes the middle child gets a little lost, but Rachel, she would sparkle. She loved Rachel. to laugh. She loved to play jokes. <laughs> Rachel had a real mischievous streak in her, and you could see it from the time she's born. There's just, you look in her eyes and you can see that little mischievous side to her. I used to cut her hair and Daryl would bring her over and he'd sit in the chair and he'd go to sleep and Rachel would be, hey, let's paint his fingernails. And then when he wakes up, that'll really shock him, you know? So she was just fun. Where's the mat? Looking fine. Matt was special always in our hearts and he was just an easy kid. Love loved sports, played football, baseball, soccer. Yeah. He was always the, either the catcher or the center, the one that had to be calm. He fit right into the role. Well, the main thing I remember about Kelly is, is just the joy that she woke up with every day. I mean, she was the happiest little kid. She would literally skip and dance and through life. Her hair got very long, very fast when she was little. And it would just, you know, swish off back and forth when she would run. And she was just a delight. And Dan was loved a lot. I mean, he was loved a lot. Danny come home from school, you get home around three, and he always had to call because we were at work. And so he'd call and say, I'm home. I'm like, OK. He goes, well, I'm going to empty the dishwasher. OK. He'd call me back. I'm going to go to the bathroom. OK. <laughs> so he'd call like three or four times just to like tell me what he was going to do next. And that was Dan. Isaiah was a little jokester, and he would just have me just laughing all the time. And he um, teased me quite a bit. <laughs> he used to tickle me, and I would just be in tears laughing. <laughs> Hello, everybody back home. Corey, he always could sense when someone was in need of support or something. And if anything was happening that was embarrassing or uncomfortable for someone, he would do something funny to, to direct the attention to him so that the person that was uncomfortable didn't have all these people looking at them and making them feel even worse. There's Daniel getting ready for his trip to France. My brother was always kind of a quiet kid. Just briefly, Daniel, what are you about to do? Go to France. <laughs> uh, go to France. He pretty much turned out exactly like my mom, and he looks just like my mom, and I turned out just like my dad. I look just like my dad. He always seemed like he was a lot older. He was very wise. National Geographic. Cassie was my sister. She was older than I was. She was awesome. She was a, she was a huge role model for me. She was very insecure of herself but Cassie didn't let other people see that. She just wanted to smile and just every, anybody that she knew, Cassie greeted with a, a huge smile and a hug and, and these bright eyes. Car. That was his first word, is car. Yeah, it's not, was it mama, dad, daddy. He looked out at the parking lot full of cars and said, car. Yes. <laughs> So that was, uh, it's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. I always called him my little knight in shining armor, and, and that just was John's nature, like washing the car. He, he washed, John asked him to wash the car, and he just went ahead and washed the other one. We didn't ask him, but what teenagers do that? Kyle was the perfect baby. He ate, he slept, and he hardly ever cried. I can remember early on, I knew he was different. There was something different about this child. And we found out that he had a stroke at birth. So years of speech therapy, years of um, working on his fine motor skills, getting him into classes 
that were appropriate for him was always a struggle um, because he appeared very normal and he was very normal and he wanted to be normal and going to um, Columbine even for the short time that he was there was probably the best placement that we'd ever gotten. I, especially with Christy Held and Amber Burgess, have probably spent more time with them in the last four years than even mom and dad. <laughs> dad, his number one love was coaching. Even if he was having a bad day, he would put himself aside and go do what needed to be done for somebody else. He was, you know, always that way. Lauren was our straight-A student. She'd never made a B in her life, never missed a day of school, I don't think. Never any trouble. Always home by curfew, had great friends. We never had to worry about her. Probably, I think it was in her junior year, and she was asking me for some advice about one of her classes. And I realized that she was just asking me to be nice, that she knew more about this than I did, because she was just sitting there going, nodding her head and going, thank you very much, Dad, that was nice. She'd study up in her bedroom, she'd draw, she'd come downstairs, she'd snuggle on the couch with her mom or her puppy dog. So excited about her senior year. She was playing volleyball, uh, co-captain of her team. She was gonna go to CSU. She had two scholarships to go and was just on the springboard of her life. On April 19th, I, uh, Bink and I went to a Rockies game. It was an early game. We got home early, early meaning 9, 9.30. Lauren was waiting for us. And she said, you know, where were you? And I said, well, honey, you, you know, you knew we were at the Rockies game. I talked to you on the phone. And no, but mom, it's, it's late. And I said, I know, but it could have been later if the game had started on a regular 7 o'clock game. Instead of a 6 o'clock game, it would have been even later. And I'm sorry, sweetie, but, you know, we came right straight from the game. And she said, I know, but I wanted to snuggle. And we missed the snuggle time. And I sat down with her and talked to her for a few minutes. And she said, you know, I'm going to go on to bed. We got my homework done. But we'll snuggle tomorrow. And I said, we'll spend extra time snuggling tomorrow. Attention, South Bend. It's a possible shot fired at Columbine High School, 6201 South Pierce, possibly in the south lower lot towards the east end. One female is down. over the speakers on the radio, I heard something about shooting at Columbine. And I was like, huh? They weren't given a whole lot of details. He said there's been a school shooting at Columbine. And I was, you know, obviously in disbelief. They said there's an incident at the high school. They wouldn't give us any specifics on what was happening. I tried to call my mom, no answer. I tried to call my stepmom, no answer, you know. And of course, my thoughts are, Dad's fine. I remember even saying to my teacher, I said, oh my God, I'm so worried my brother goes to that school. And she said, I'm sure he's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. So as I'm heading home, I hear that shots are fired in the library and that they believe people are dead. And I wanted to go to the school, but you couldn't. And there was a police barricade around the school. I hear that kids are scattering, that they're just streaming out of the school. And uh, finally got to an elementary school where they were having parents meet. bus loads of kids would be dropped off and I can just remembering just uh, 
and you think of what are the odds? You know, I mean, there's a school shooting. There's 2,000 kids in the, in the school. You know, what are the odds? We waited and waited, and more parents were leaving with their kids, and you know, so all you could do was was pray that she's not hurt. Towards the end of the buses coming in, Lauren hadn't come yet, and I, I remember standing there as they were reading off this list of names, and just in my mind going, Lauren Townsend, Lauren Townsend, Lauren Townsend, and just willing her name to be the next one on the list. And, and then the buses stopped coming. One of the firemen that was, was there, he was bending over, doing something in his bag of equipment. And I said, Is, are there any more buses? And I remember he glanced up at me and then he turned back to his bag and he said, I think there's one more. And I think now he did that because he didn't want to tell me, that's it, there's, there's no more buses. I remember looking at John Tomlin's face and seeing in his face what I felt. I think I knew already. I think it, it was just um, settled in my heart that he just wasn't coming back. I, I believe I just already knew. Yeah, that's because he was the kind of guy that would have called yeah. and said, I'm OK, or I'm here, or whatever. And you know, after hours and hours, you know, there's no call. I felt kind of stupid for not knowing. I felt as though I should have known when our world changed so dramatically. You know, when she died, I should have, the earth should have shaken or something. I should have known when something so traumatic had happened to us. The ones who weren't seeing their kids were kind of getting moved towards the gymnasium and, uh, there's all the people in the gymnasium that we've come to know so well over the course of the last eight years. We had no idea who they were, who their kids were, how, you know, within 24 hours we were going to be connected and we'll be connected for the rest of our lives. To the families who have lost their loved ones, to the parents who have lost their beloved children, to the wounded children and their families, to the people of the community of Littleton, I can only say tonight that the prayers of the American people are with you. I think the worst part for me was not knowing. I, w I would have rather someone come up and said Rachel died instead of not knowing for 24 hours. They wanted to make positive identifications before they told the people. And there are so many victims inside the school that they were going through everything they could to make sure they didn't do it incorrectly. We knew it was just a matter of confirmation, which I got actually about 24 hours later, about 11.30 the next day. We didn't find out till Thursday morning that John... Officially. Yeah, that John was dead. And as we mentioned earlier in the newscast, CNN is now reporting that Columbine is the single worst mass shooting in U.S. history. The story is also receiving coverage on TV and radio. We heard on TV. And I'm paraphrasing, but the gist of the announcement was if your child had not come home, your child was amongst the dead. The names are out. This community now knows for whom they are bringing flowers, balloons, and cards. Two days ago, 17-year-old Rachel Scott drove her car to school. 
It sits here in the parking lot still, a grim reminder that she'll never drive it home, she'll never graduate, she'll never see her friends or family again. The burden of grief will linger here for many years to come. A very large part of my life had just been taken. It was such emptiness, I wasn't sure how to cope. And we had to do all of that coping in front of a camera, under a microscope. TV cameras are everywhere. I mean, this was national media, not local media. There was a whole media circus that happened there in that park. I felt like I had suffered through my grief in a fishbowl. You know, even for a week, you had no idea what was going on and, and how big of a thing it really was. The question why resonates across the nation at this hour. Two students opened fire inside Columbine High School. It took less than an hour for the two gunmen to murder 12 students, a teacher, then take their own lives. Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris. Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Gunman Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. This was the site of the absolute horror of April 20th. I think the media tends to sensationalize it. And the collateral damage for that is the families that are affected. When you receive a magazine in the mail or you turn on the TV and your child's killer's face is on the screen and all the coverage and all the in-depth reporting is about why this happened and what drove them to do it. Um, they're glorifying these evil acts and I worry that other people seeking attention, other people that are unstable will try to outdo them. For me, and that certainly was so hard to process, especially amidst all, all the grief, because uh, we were still at the point then where you know, the, the grief was so real that it's, it's actually a physical pain. It's like somebody stabbing you with a knife. It makes it a lot harder. I don't, think, I don't think I actually did any grieving until maybe two years after Columbine. Sometimes you just really want to talk to your loved one. You just want to be near them, and this is about as close as you can get to them, is at their grave. I come out probably once a month now. The first three years, it was every week, several times a week. What I do is I um, wash his grave. I wash it four times a year. I just clean it up. I was very blessed. I had two wonderful, wonderful children. When they were little, I, I danced with them. First on my, you know, they'd stand on my feet and we'd dance. And um, Corey, he was a good dancer. Corey and I had a last dance the night before he was killed. That last dance was pretty special. So, yeah. Before Corey was killed, he told me that he wanted to have three children. So I miss Corey's family, the daughter-in-law and the grandchildren I'll never have. I miss everything about him, everything that he was and was going to be. Just losing a child 
you can't breathe. You can't understand why this happened. And I'd come to the grave and ask God to give him back to me. I still ask God to give him back to me. I just want him back. And you know the reality, but you just keep hoping it's just a nightmare. I'm going to wake up, and it's not going to be this way. But it is a nightmare, and he's never coming back. I feel that Daniel's still there behind the things that I do because, to me, I mean, he is still alive. Well, this is probably about the dozen times I've gone out in the past few weeks taking flyers door to door in support of a candidate from here in the Columbine area who's running for the state senate. And especially supporting her because I feel that, that she would support reasonable gun laws. person I'm opposing here is an extremist. He opposes gun control, period. I just think it would be sad to have Columbine represented by someone who is a gun extremist, who wanted to do away with Amendment 22 that we passed in 2000. It was a few days um, after Columbine that a good friend of mine called and, and said, did you know that the NRA was having uh, their national convention in Denver, because they're going to have a protest against the convention. I am here today because my son Daniel would want me to be here today. Yeah. If my son Daniel was not one of the victims, he would be here with me today. I really felt I had to speak because because of what Daniel said to me, you know, just two weeks before Columbine, Dad, did you know there were loopholes in the Brady Bill, you know, the national law that requires background checks um, of anybody who wants to purchase a gun? Something is wrong in this country when a child can grab a gun, grab a gun so easily and shoot a bullet. <laughs> into the middle of a child's face as my son experienced. That's kind of what launched me, was speaking up that day to a crowd of 10, 12,000 people. He took a leave of absence from his job to fight for tougher gun safety laws. Tom Mauser, we thank you for being here tonight. And he has turned his sorrow and his grief into something positive for every one of you in this room tonight. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Tom Mauser. Do you believe that the Second Amendment provides us with an absolute right? Because that's to me what it's all about. Yeah, Amendment 22 was something that we petitioned on to the ballot here in Colorado that closed the so-called gun show loophole. Uh, it was essentially a loophole in the Brady Bill that allowed people who were criminals or kids to go to a gun show and buy a gun without going through a background check. Now closing this loophole is a, just a small, reasonable step towards reducing the terrible toll of gun violence. Maybe a small step, but it sure sends a big message to the NRA and the gun lobby and the legislature and the rest of this country. Hi, how are you? I'm Tom Mauser, I live on the other side of uh, Pierce, right. and I'm walking for Paula Noonan. She's running for state senate. Right, thanks. thanks a lot. 
where I sometimes get resistance is the, is the notion of you really can't keep guns away from criminals and kids. They're going to get them anyhow. And, you know, despite the tragedy I've been through and how it could be such a downer, I, I, I refuse to accept that notion. I think you have to look at prevention. You have to look at hope. There have, you have to take steps to keep guns away from these people. I will get emails um, attacking me. I mean, one, one man said to me, what your, what your son needed was a better father. And I wrote back to him and said, you didn't know my son and you don't know me. How dare you say such a thing? How dare you say such a thing? This man said, well, you're just, you're just trying to capitalize on what happened to Columbine. Capitalize? Capitalize? I lost my son, for God's sake. I just don't want to have other people lose children. And we lose way too many in this country. That's what this is all about. Yeah, these were Daniel's shoes. And, you know, I didn't really even know until after he died that we had the same shoe size and I could fit into them. So during the campaign in 2000, whenever I was at a rally or something that was about Amendment 22, I wore these shoes because it was very symbolic. I'm walking in Daniel's shoes. I will just keep plugging away and keep plugging away and keep plugging away because you have to. It's gotten easier, but Columbine for a long time was very hard for me to at times drive by. Um, sometimes you just look and you can imagine all the horror and, and terror that went on in there. And it just, for a long time, I would at times go out of my way to find a different route home so I didn't have to come by it. Um, knowing that Kelly died there. But. At the same time, it's over time, and, and you know it's for all the new students coming in, it's, it's their high school, and it should be a place that they enjoy and love to come to. Um, it's also a place that, where Kelly, Kelly died, but also God sent me an angel here one day, and that helped a lot. <laughs> Don had wanted to come and look at the progress on the new Hope Columbine Memorial Library. I had just recently been here with a lot of the other families, so I decided to stay in the car. And he jumped out, take a look around, and the way he had pulled into the parking lot, I suddenly found myself looking up at the windows of the old library. And I was kind of just looking, looking up there and started talking to Kelly and telling her how much I missed her. And, just loved her and was so sorry for what had happened to her there. And, and I was praying to God that, that she was just truly happy and at peace. And it was like almost immediately a movement caught my eye as I was looking up in the windows. And I realized there was a figure moving across the front of the old library windows. I knew almost instantly it was an angel. I was like, oh my gosh. And she was she was very clear to me when she started. She had um, like a long flowing gown. I knew she was very elegant. And I was just, oh my gosh, I, that's an angel. And I wish I had a camera. <laughs> that was the thought that came to mind. And then I realized I did have a camera sitting here in the front seat. So I grabbed the camera. I took a couple of pictures really quick. And then she was gone. I just knew she was sent as an answer to my prayer. and. I knew she had brought me a message from Kelly, and I knew she was just telling me that I am with you always, Mom, and I am happy, and I am at peace. So when I got the pictures back, and I was really able to look at her um, for the first time, I recognized her immediately, and I knew I had seen this angel before. Right after Thanksgiving, I had started making my Christmas cards, 
this angel on, on my Christmas card had really helped me through this second Christmas without Kelly. And I knew when I saw the picture that God had sent me the same angel as an answer to my prayer to, to comfort me and to, to just let me know Kelly was truly happy and at peace and that she, she is always with me. And uh, it was just, I just felt so incredibly blessed to have been given such a gift. I could see her, her hair flowing behind her. I could see her little halo above her and her, her hands were outstretched as though she were still holding the star that she held on my Christmas card. I think about her every day, and uh, she just reassures me that Kelly's okay and we're all okay. Well, this is my office, and uh, this is what we call the Rachel corner of my office, and a lot of her, uh, her backpack, her diary, a uh, number of books that were, have been written about her. Rachel carried journals with her from the time she was about, I think, 13. She loved to write in her journals. She left our family with six journals. And of course, uh, as we began to read them afterwards, we were amazed at the prophetic element of some of her writing. Well, and this is her diary. Yeah, this was the diary. It was in her backpack the day that she died. And you see the words, I won't be labeled as average. And then there's a bullet hole that uh, almost like an exclamation mark to that statement. And on the front of the diary, she said, I write not for the sake of glory, not for the sake of fame, not for the sake of success, but for the sake of my soul, Rachel Joy. I spoke before a House Judiciary Committee at Congress shortly after the Columbine tragedy, and they were wanting to talk about gun control. And I just said, I don't think that that's the issue. I really believe it's the influences on the hearts of our young people. I don't do this for therapy or healing or closure. Uh, I view it as something that Rachel would have wanted done. About a month before Rachel died, she had written an essay for a fifth period class, and I found it under her bed and fallen out of her school books and fallen mattress screens. It was two pages entitled, My Ethics, My Quotes of Life. And in this essay, Rachel challenged her reader to start what she called a chain reaction with kindness and compassion. Her message is that there's just no place for the kind of anger and violence and things that happened at Columbine. This story has the ability to bring a major cultural change to a school. We don't uh, project a complex story. It's a very simple story of one person who believed she could make a difference by treating the people the way she wanted to be treated. That's it. In the early days, telling Rachel's story was, was very difficult, but the reward was seeing lives touched and changed because immediately we realized that there were young people who were considering suicide that would write us and say, I changed my mind. And that's happened for years. 
And we've also known of some school shootings that have been prevented because of her story as well. I'm not a counselor and I'm not a therapist, but I, I feel like one a lot of times because they just need someone to talk to. Rachel's Challenge is a three-year program and it involves a full school assembly, then a training session with about 100 students that form a Friends of Rachel program as follow-up because we know there needs to be follow-up, not just emotional impact. I always defend the right to have a click. <laughs> Because most people have cliques, even adults. It's just people you like to hang around with. Nothing wrong with that. It's when your clique thinks it's better than the other clique that you have a problem. And when your cliques don't clack, that's when you create a problem in your school. I really enjoy the trainings because I can be myself a little more than I can in the assembly. In the assembly, I'm honoring Rachel's life. In the trainings, I'm kind of letting the little boy out inside of me. Doesn't he look younger? <laughs> So get to know the real person, not the attitude. See through all of those things to the reality of who that person is. I can't fathom doing anything else anymore. It's, it's fulfilling to me, and it's fulfilling to, uh, I think, to Rachel's dream. This was just two days before she died. Isn't she beautiful? Columbine happened right after prom, and I have a real special memory of shopping with Lauren the Thursday before prom. She had her dress, we'd fixed up her shoes, but she needed, uh, she wanted a clip for her hair and a bracelet and a shawl, so we went, uh, went shopping for that. We went to dinner, just the two of us, and had a a really nice time. And uh, then after she died, I got the bill from Nordstrom's for the items that I'd bought for her for prom, and I've saved it. I, you know, that's one of my last memories is helping her get ready for prom. For the most part, people were supportive and caring. There were a few insensitive comments that were made. I remember being in my doctor's office and when she walked in, she says, now was it your daughter or Rick's daughter? And I said, it was Rick's daughter. And she says, oh, I wonder how her poor mother feels. And I felt like I just evaporated right there in front of her, that my grief was not valid because I was not her mother. People don't understand that a family doesn't always have to be related by blood. I'd been Lauren's stepmother for 10 years and I loved her like my own, like I'd love all the kids. I was so raw and, and so vulnerable and hurting so much that I began to question the, the role that I had played in Lauren's life. Was my grief really valid? Had I been valid to her or had I been invisible too? I saw a counselor for a while. I think it was just a process that I needed to go through, but I don't think that it was the reason that I, that the counseling was the reason that I was able to, to move beyond it. I made a conscious decision to do something one day a week that would honor Lauren's memory. And there was one of the students that had been injured at Columbine that was, in therapy every day and the family was struggling with getting her to and from her therapy sessions. I called her and offered to give her one day a week and we, we started out with just me taking her to her therapy on, on Thursdays and then over the years it developed into a, a true friendship that has been healing for both of us. Hi sweetie. Hello, how are you? Fine, how are you? Good. Sue Townsend, she um, was thinking of a way to honor her stepdaughter Lauren's memory, and she started to drive me to physical therapy, and we just we just bonded instantly. 
I don't remember the physical pain of the bullet going into me. I, I just remember the emotional fear of, of seeing people get getting shot around me. Everyone called me their miracle girl because I, I shouldn't be here. It was a long, hard recovery after that. I spent six weeks in critical care unit and then six weeks in the multi-trauma unit and then two months at Craig Hospital, the rehabilitation hospital for uh, brain and spinal cord injuries. Hello. The Townsends have enriched my life tremendously. They are people I can go to if I'm having an issue. It's not just, you know, a friendship that's superficial, that we just, you know, go shopping or go see a movie. It's deep, it's close. We, we were gone all last week, and oh. she was over with Richard and Tamara, so I think she's glad to be home. They share their bad day. I can share my bad day, and I, I feel not judged by them. I feel that, you know, they can be my sounding boards and give me advice, and their family has just been amazing. I've gotten to know all of their family, and just to be included in those, those family functions is just so honoring to me. I love them so much. I'm so glad that we have gotten to know each other. It's just been a joy for us to watch her blossom into this incredible young woman, and, um, and how she has risen above the handicap and the hardships that she's had to, to face. And it's been an inspiration to us. Okay, Mom, okay. We're at my church uh, in Aurora, Colorado, and I felt secure about doing the interview here. Isaiah went into the hospital a couple of weeks before his death, and it was stress-related. Isaiah was always in a mostly white schools growing up, and he always, at school, had to endure being treated differently, you know? Even though we say today, um, Oh, that don't happen at the school, which is not true. Until we face the facts and correct them and correct the problems, it's going to always happen and be covered up. His sisters came to me, and they had asked me to speak with their father about removing them from the school because of all the hatred and the racism. The thing uh, that upset me is what the name called him that he had to endure when he died. The, the racial names and things. No child should have to endure that. The pain is just horrible. To see one of your loved ones hurting, that's what I went through. To see his dad and mom them hurt it the way they and couldn't do anything about it. If I hadn't been in to God and to Christ as I was, I would have been so angry. I don't know what I would have did. The anger would have overwhelmed me to a point that I don't know what my actions would have been. Jesus got talked about. He got spit on. He got ridiculed. He got shamed. He got talked about. The same thing, if you're following Jesus, don't you know it's going to happen to you? If you really follow me. But most of the time, most people don't really follow. Because it depends on who's company we in. We need to step up as a nation to teach these kids to see God's love and the family love and where to go when they need attention. We're letting evil overrule goodness. If we are prepared and prayed up and seeking God, it don't it won't affect the children as it does today. They won't be going around here doing stupid things. Maybe we can as a country wake up. And that's what I truly hope.
Yeah, when it first, Columbine first happened, I couldn't even look at the pictures. Just to look at them was too painful. Everybody would say, well, they're good memories, they're good memories. And I remember thinking, I don't want memories, I want him. But now I do treasure the memories. This was the first one that I got. This was right after Columbine. It has my dad's name, and then it has his birth date and his death date, and then it's his daddy's girl. And this one I actually got probably in the first week. And then a few years later, <laughs> um, the pose of dad against the fence where he's, it's, you can't miss it. If you know anything about Columbine, you know my dad leaning against the fence in his Columbine jacket, you know, in his pants with his arms crossed leaning against the fence. And that's always stuck to me, so I thought, well, you know, what better place to put it but on me forever. That was his field. That's where he played. He's probably still sitting up there staring at it. I got my own field. found ours. Mom. Grandpa, yeah. thanks for the bedtime snacks. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> this is the one the grandkids did. He was the king of bedtime snacks. He would do like worms and dirt. It'd be crushed up Oreos with gummy worms sticking out of the top. And then he would, when we went to bed, he uh, would swing us. He'd go one, two, three and drop us into bed. And he kind of stopped that after I hit my head on the headboard. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. I love you, baby. I love you, too. Well, back here, I've got all the stuff that I had. Um, it's all of Danny's stuff. And most of these boxes are filled with things that people sent to us after Danny died. You know, and it's like, obviously, I don't know what's in all the boxes. It's like somebody had sent this pillow, and they had taken the picture of Danny and put it on this pillow and sent it to us. It warmed my heart that so many people cared and, and just took the time. You look at all the pictures of him when he was little. They go, they go through the stages, like, where you, you know, when you're, you first have your kids, you take, like, a bazillion pictures. And then you go through the phase where you don't take quite as many, and, and then it's like, I always wish that I would have taken a lot more, but he was a neat kid. We had a lot of fun with him. So I put them all in these trays. So I've got, I mean, this one's full. This tray's full of cards. I mean, the, the letter would come addressed to Danny Rohrbaugh's mom. And there would be no address, no state, or it said, one of them said like Littleton, Colorado, but there's no postage even, and they, and they were delivered. I mean, so there's just a lot of, a lot of outpouring of, of love. How do you part with this stuff that people sent from the heart? And so it'll probably, wherever I move, I just have to have a room for Danny's stuff. This is uh, Kelly's room. And the room still has a lot of, a lot of Kelly's mementos in it. This was her, her alien right here. And the neat thing about this alien is this alien was blown up with Kelly's air, and it's still in there. And just over the last few months has this alien started to lose a little bit of his air. So that, I don't know if that's a good sign for <laughs> Kelly, but it's... Kelly's air. I love that her air's in there. My brother's room, I think, was closed off pretty early on. Grief hits people differently. There are some parents, I'm sure, that didn't, maybe even to this day, didn't change what their kid's room was like. And it was, I think, in my family, too hard to have that there, that memory there. And I remember my mom taking all the stuff out and moving it out, and like most of it was gone within a year. And 
I mean, I, I definitely am not like, mad that she did that. I'm almost mad at myself that I didn't go in there and maybe like pick through some of his stuff and, and pick some of it out that was important to me and keep it because I don't have that anymore. The hardest is with their surviving children. I think that is the most overlooked group. It wasn't until a while that that finally clicked with us that, gee, we're, you know, we have all this love surrounding us with the poor siblings, you know, like they're forgotten, they're on, out on their own. We literally received thousands, over 2,000 letters, probably more, mm -hmm. from people all over the globe, mostly the United States, but people from outside the United States as well. And out of all those letters, maybe five, were addressed to Aaron. Nobody thought of the siblings. It is kind of startling when you're 13 years old and you've always relied on your parents to help you with everything that all of a sudden they're worse off than you are and you're just so confused. And everyone's looking at you like, oh my God, how can I help you? What can I do? And there was just really nothing anyone could do. Sometimes I wanted to just be alone, and I was so annoyed because everyone was too, too afraid to leave me alone. I wasn't concerned about the things most 13-year-olds were concerned about. I didn't care about boys. I didn't really care about school. I was more concerned about how am I going to keep my family together? How am I going to um, deal with all this grief? It was definitely hard for my parents because they both mourn in different ways. My mom was more of like, I wanted to sit around and do nothing and just mourn and cry about the loss. Where me and my dad bonded in the sense that we just had to always keep going and doing things. I went through a lot of depression uh, after Columbine. There was a couple years that I was just kind of in a dark place. Well, Craig went through so much that day in the li library, losing two friends, having lost a sister. He would fight going to sleep at night because of knowing that he was going to have a nightmare. His whole family rallied around him. He went to counseling for a period of time. It, the battle wasn't over. It, it was two years of intensive emotional upheaval. I literally lost it at times in my house where I just had these fits of rage and put holes through walls. And there was a few times I was uncontrollable because I was dealing with so much anger. I lost my brother. I lost a part of my parents. That was something I always just kept in. You see your father break down, your mother break down, and everybody around you is breaking down. It was easier for me to step into the role of trying to be a strong person and try to let people cry on your shoulder. And it was easier for me to deal with it that way. You know, one of the things I ran into was uh, if I did occasionally break down and cry, especially in front of my uh, mom or my, you know, some of the other people, you know, it would automatically make them cry. And I didn't want to make them cry, so I would try not to show that as much as possible. The question I dread is how many brothers and sisters do you have? And I never know what to say. Sometimes I say, uh, I have two older brothers and just kind of act like he's still alive. Other times I just say, oh, I have an older brother. I had so many people who would, either by mistake or because I reminded them of her, always call me Lauren. Even my parents made the mistake. It was another reminder of, you know, that, that void. So I felt like I kind of was almost a constant reminder too that I reminded them once again that she's not here. One of the things, worst things they ever said to my sons was big boys don't cry because yeah. <laughs> I really found out that that's not true <laughs> and I think we both found that out. Yeah. With Craig with what he went through um, he was so damaged <laughs> I you know I didn't I didn't know what to do to heal him. One day I was in the, the living room and I was watching this, this movie. And it started to get real violent and started to have these uh, flashbacks. And I turned to my brother 
And I said, change the channel. And he said, why? And I snapped. I picked him up and I carried him to the kitchen and I slammed him on the kitchen floor. And I pulled out a kitchen knife and I put it in front of his face and I said, do you want to know what it feels like to almost lose your life? Even to this day, there's times when he'll, he will get a little moody. He has a handle on it. He's doing good. He's matured a lot. But after I'm gone, my son will still struggle with what happened. It'll be with him the rest of his life. I never knew what mental anguish was, you know, or pain until we lost Matt. I mean, I had no idea that it could hurt so much that the minute you wake up and the first breath you take, you're in such despair and sense of hopelessness because you can't fix it, you can't change death. That you have to learn how to accept it. After Matt was killed, for us personally to send Adam to Columbine was, I don't know if I really could have done that to drop him off at school every day. For us, it was really gonna be a challenge to do that. And, you know, our son Adam just went through so much for, he was only 12, he was just a little guy, you know, when it happened. He kind of made the decision, you know, for us, and he goes, Mom, I don't want to, I, I need a fresh start. I want to start school somewhere new and different. And that sort of was, kind of gave us permission to go ahead and move up here and, and um, try to make a new life up here. And once she started the horse thing, it just kind of is an addiction now. She'll come driving by and come up here just to feed or groom the horses, you know, just, it's her, it's her little escape. I realized for the first time since Matt died that I was happy. I love him. Mm. He loves me because I bring carrots. But it was the first time like I would wake up and and or when when I was riding and say, Oh my god, I'm gonna ride today. You know, like I felt like anticipation for something to do. And I never felt like that. I mean it took that long. After Matt died, it's like I didn't think I'd ever want to do anything again. When Ashley and Joe are with me, it's like the most perfect day for me in the world. It's just go riding. And I feel like Matthew comes along with us when we ride, and I, I can't, I don't know, there's nothing I'd rather do than go riding on a day off. You know, coming here, it made me realize that we're having more good times than kind of sad and bad times, and I guess, to me, the most important message, because, you know, we do talk to a lot of people that just have lost their kid, that there is hope, that you will have a life again, and that, you will have joy again, and you will have um, a sense of, of, what is it? Happiness. Happiness. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. it. Our nation is shocked and saddened by the news of the shootings at Virginia Tech today. The exact toll has not yet been confirmed, but it appears that more than 30 people were killed and many more were wounded. Police say they received a 911 call at 7 this morning and then two hours later from Norris Hall, where most of the fatalities are believed to have occurred. As the gunman moved through a classroom building, students frantically tried to get out. He just started shooting, didn't say anything. Police say they believe there was only one shooter and that he is dead. 
irrational acts that led to the shooting of more than 50 people. 30 of them just in this building would die. We really didn't learn what happened at Columbine. And let's put it in perspective. How many people must die? How much blood? Virginia Tech says classes are canceled tomorrow. Here we go again. I, I just felt kind of crushed. It just all came rushing back to me, knowing what those people were going through, what those parents were going through. And it just brought back all those memories to me of what we had gone through. I, I would have liked to think that Columbine was the last school shooting that should have ever happened. And the fact that it won't be scares me. Since the campus was not sealed off soon after those... The thing that drove me most nuts is to end it. I have heard it in the days following were newscasters and radio hosts and crime violent people who were saying now that we might as well get used to this, this is the way it's gonna be. And I just could not believe it. It's like we keep moving the moral compass is bad enough, but now we're gonna start finding things like this acceptable in any way, shape or form and get used to it, <laughs> no way. You can't. <laughs> One is not acceptable, ever. I believe that what we focus on as a society is what is going to grow. And if we focus on the horror and the tragedy and the evil, that that's what will grow. They found all of the media footage of um, the shooter, and they started to release all the pictures of him with the guns and with the black clothing. and. It just brought so many memories back. I'm a person who believes that Americans should have to face this kind of video. As, as tough as it is, I think we unfortunately do need to take a look into the face, into the eyes, into the actions of people who do these things. We have to know who this person is and what the face of evil is and what his name is. And in this case, he mentioned Cleveland and Harris. I think it's good to know who the killer is. We can't keep that under wraps, but yeah, it hurts. I'm glad there's gonna to continue to be a debate in this country about how we can stop these kinds of shootings. I, I think it can only help to have that discussion. But it, it still bothers me, though, that we only do that after these terrible shootings, and we ignore the fact that we lose so many people every day to gunshots in this country. This memorial is bigger than us. It's bigger than today. The memorial is going to be here two centuries from now when our great, great, great grandkids know nothing about Columbine. I have mixed feelings about that memorial. I mean, I thought it should be there, but it should never have been built. I mean, I wish it would never have been built, and I hope there's never another one have to be built. But it's kind of silly when you look at the country that we have that we're building memorials. There's companies that specialize in memorials for brand pages. Is that the dumbest thing you ever thought of? I went to Columbine. So for anybody to say that there was no bullying and there's not cliques, 
<laughs> you know? You can't put a thousand teenagers in one place and have a big happy family. It just doesn't happen. Columbine was pretty bad. It's not happy little Never Never Land. It's high school. As far as Eric and Dylan themselves are concerned, they're victims too. It takes something to get somebody to that point where they are so depressed and they are so angry that the only way they can see out of their black hole or whatever you want to call it is an event like Columbine. Obviously, those kids were crying out for help. They needed help, and nobody paid attention to them. It's hard to forgive, but we have to remember that when we forgive, we're not forgiving what action took place. We're forgiving so that we can go on and still be good people. There's no way I can ever forgive them. They took Lauren from us. They've completely changed this family. And, you know, consequently to, to forgive them for that, I, I can't do it. I'm still angry at at uh, at Klebold and Harris, um, and I always will be. Uh, but I don't let it consume me. I just don't have the hate. There was a time when I was very angry, and anymore I just I don't even have the energy for that. It's just it, it is what it is. I've chosen not to view them as monsters. I've chosen not to view them uh, as any, anything other than young men who made choices that led them down a, a dark path and ended up taking their lives. Their parents suffered deeply, just like we suffered. You know, Cleveland's parents sent us a card that basically had been written by their lawyer. You know, no compassion in it basically, you know, saying they're quote unquote sorry, but sorry really didn't come through in the words. The Harrises, we sat across the table from them and not once did they say we're sorry that you lost your daughter. You know, they didn't say it because they know they own some responsibility in this. They know they own some responsibility in it. And it's one of those things that you know, will drive me crazy for the rest of my life. Occasionally somebody says, I can't think of anything worse than what you experienced, and I think there is something worse than what I've experienced. And that is if my son, my boys had done what Eric and Dylan did, to me, that would have been a lot worse because these people lost their children and they lost any semblance of a good memory. Tell Grandpa, tell Grandpa what you did today. Nobody goes through this life without, without loss and pain. Many people have gone through what, what we have gone through. We have just gone through it with 12 other families together at the same time that have shared this same horrible event. 
But every day, people lose their children through violence or tragedy. I, I can't imagine getting through this without these other families. And yet we've all healed in such different ways. But we gave ourselves permission. I remember the meeting that we sat there and said, we're all going to get through this a different way. Look at that texture of youth. <laughs> Some of us are going to be right out there. Some of us are going to be more quiet and take a different path. But whatever road we take, whatever path that looks like, it's all going to be acceptable. You have other children, and you have, you know, other people that need you to, to be well. And so you start thinking about others, and you start, you start that healing path. Sure. We can still look at shoes. That's fine. I think when you've lost someone and you look back on it, you realize what a gift an ordinary day is and you really appreciate what an ordinary day is. You can scoot down here and come off that jump right there. One of the things that I realized uh, afterwards that I wasn't as close to my children as I wanted to be. I wasn't as close to my older kids as I was to Lauren. It's one of those things that I realized how, how dear that is and uh, how important that is. It's all about remembering the good and the bad and what you learned from it, but learn something from it and try to do something about it because obviously you're gonna feel strongly about it if you lost someone you loved in such a horrible way um, that you wanna change things. Even if a loved one died of a disease or something, you probably wanna be like, wow, I wanna make it so other people don't die from that disease, make it so other people don't die from this sort of violence. I know this is a documentary about Columbine, but it's bigger than Columbine. I don't know the answers. I just know that there's a lot of kids dying in schools, and we have to put our heads together and try to do something to help them. Was Columbine different from any other school? I don't think so. That's the whole point, that it can happen anywhere if you don't grab hold of these kids and the parents aren't parenting and are more concerned about what's going on outside of the home instead of inside and involved in your children's lives. You know, we just all have to somehow be vigilant and, you know, watch our kids and be in their lives and, you know, love them, hug them. We need to start getting proactive instead of reactive.